If you haven't seen the previous video in this series, follow the link on your screen or click the link in the description or pinned comment below. And if you haven't seen my parody of CinemaSins on this movie yet, click this link. You may as well watch it because I'm going to be referencing it a lot in this video. <laughs> anyway, enjoy! Three seconds of Justice Legos. If we're going to do the whole X seconds of Logos thing, can we at least get X right? It's 44 seconds, not 43. I know because Barami told me so. Holy sh 44 seconds of Logos. Marvel sure has outdone themselves this time. I mean, this is 10% of the movie's runtime. DC Comics. Why are we rehashing Superman's death again? It's not like this version of Justice League isn't going to bring him back. So why do we even care that this happens? I mean, Batman movies stopped showing Bruce Wayne's parents getting killed after the first time they did that back in 1989, right? Right? Why show Superman's death? Do you not realize this is the director's cut of this movie? Meaning there's a ton of extra and relevant content here that was cut because death, Joss Whedon, and WB f***ing suck? Okay, Whedon is okay when he's doing Firefly things, but still, Superman's death is entirely relevant to this story, and this scene showed that Supes' death cry was a beacon of sorts that let the mother boxes know the Earth's protector is no longer alive. Don't worry folks, if this evil alien super being comes back to life after Superman has stabbed it with kryptonite, Batman is here at the ready to grapple hook it back to death. It's almost like that isn't a grapple hook, but a gun that launched the kryptonite at Zod's face or something. Also, I get it. The greatest superhero in the world looks like he's pretty f***ing hurt. Maybe even dying. But he's still alive now, and currently screaming in pain! Batman and Diana have been all over this fight up until now, so why aren't they at least moving that way to try and help? This is a death cry. I know it isn't canon, but didn't you see the scene in Superman Returns where even doctors tried to help Clark, but they couldn't even penetrate his skin because he's Superman? Yeah, what the hell do you expect Bruce and Diana to do here exactly? Zack Snyder thought the only thing that would make the whole mother box situation more nonsensical is to stick one of those powerful motherfuckers in a f***ing coat closet. You're mixing realities here. Zack Snyder is the director. He exists in the real world. The mother boxes exist in the fictional world. That means that Zack didn't stick a powerful item in a closet. A character did. I know this sounds like I'm being pedantic, and I am, but Jeremy does this all the time, and it's why his sins don't make sense. You see, he's sinning Zack Snyder for something a character in a story does. This is like sinning J.K. Rowling because Neville forgets the password to the Gryffindor common room. Man, Superman's screams of anguish are so powerful that they can make it all the way to Gotham City, which we know is and has always been a short distance across the bay from Metropolis. The comics have long been clear that this is a San Francisco-Oakland-like situation. What was this sin for? Superman's super voice or that Gotham and Metropolis have always been shown to be close in the comics? Because they have. You literally just stated facts and counted that as a sin. Doesn't Jesse Eisenberg's Luther seem exactly like the kind of guy who would be cracking wise right now about how he's standing navel deep in a pool of alien goo water? No? Why is Superman hollering making it only to the characters we know in this universe? Can normal humans hear them? Why is it even necessary for the metas to take note of this strange noise? Don't they watch the news? According to the end of the last movie, every network was covering that f***ing fight between the Discount Avengers and Abomination. What a stupid ass question. They literally just showed a scene of Superman's voice traveling through a cityscape. Do you honestly think regular people in those buildings didn't hear that? Also, I'd like to point out to the idiots that can't recognize a parody, when Baramy was calling this movie a Marvel movie, now you know where that comes from. It's almost like a parody is making fun of something that actually exists. Man, whoever piloted this drone through all this CGI deserves a raise. I see they have their own hockey arena in Themyscira coming up. Yes, I get that these are jokes, and heck, the first one was even funny. But earlier in this video, you made a joke that wasn't actually a sin of this movie and didn't count it on the sin counter. 
I was almost proud of you for taking my advice and just making a joke and moving on. But why didn't you do that here? Clearly, these aren't things actually wrong with this movie, so I will continue to say you should have a separate counter for jokes and one for sins. Do these warriors seriously spend all day, every day, just standing around this mother box? I know, I know, it's important and stuff, but do all these ladies have to guard it? Hell, the one in the U.S. has apparently been hanging out with the snow boots and the land's end jackets for the last millennium, and it's been fine until now. They weren't always here. The Amazons have gathered around this box because it has shown signs of coming back online. Or to life. Whatever, you know what the f I mean. This is Bruce Wayne. This movie thinks Bruce Wayne would camp out on a snowy mountaintop with a small fire and a horse, and this movie is already funnier than the 40-year-old virgin. I think the fact that a non-comic book reader like yourself thinks that he wouldn't is even funnier. Seriously, what the hell do you know about this comic book character? The books don't matter, remember? I see now why we needed the full four-hour cut of this film, so that we could fully appreciate the entire f***ing journey Bruce takes to Hoth to find Arthur. Seriously, the entirety of the Lord of the Rings franchise had less footage of walking in the mountains than this opening scene. I'm gonna ignore you pronouncing Arthur as Arthur, and even give you a pass on the pop culture references to point out that I will be periodically playing my parody version of this video at certain points of this deconstruction of Cinema Sins and treat them as sins of Cinema Sins. Why? Well, because I'm almost certain Baramese was funnier and to point out how he predicted what Jeremy would say. For instance, A too many minutes of bat walking. I thought Batman was rich. What the f*** is he doing hiking on this treacherous terrain? Where's that flying torso he used to remove that bomb bane set up? Why do these movies pretend like the previous movies never happened? <laughs> yep, because this is how movies normally go. It's almost like movies are art and all art should be as unique as possible. I can't believe you're sending a movie for not being like other movies. Also, that f***ing laugh. Is there a reason we're getting the perspective of this conversation through a dirty-ass interior window? Are we peeping on these people? That just feels weird, even for this movie. This, coming from the dude that said the 10-year-old Emma Watson wasn't old enough to be hot yet. Also, what? How dare this dog speak to us like children? What's up this guy's ass? Gili here just offered the town $25,000 to talk to Aquaman, and doesn't look like he's f***ing around at all. Sure, he's asking questions, but is he posing any threat to the village at all that would get this elder all fired up? Unsurprisingly, CinemaSins didn't get the point of the scene. Firstly, these people are trying to protect Aquaman's identity by lying about not knowing anything about him. Secondly, in order to do that, they have to make him seem like a myth or a children's story. That's what the line was. How dare you speak to us like children by making up stories about gods and magical watermen. I mean, he basically says exactly that in the part of the scene you cut out. How dare this dog speak to us like children? Oh, magical man from the sea. We are poor, not stupid. Dress like a bat. You're out of your mind, Bruce Wayne. Maybe, but not because he dresses like a bat, right? Look, I'm not one to shit on Batman and his fanboys. Okay, yes I am. But a grown man that dresses like a bat to scare criminals is kind of crazy when you sit down and think about it. Like, who's scared of bats? I mean, Daredevil does this concept way better with his eyes closed. Wait. Sea shanties. Baramy did it better. Skip! You may think this cut of the film was rated R because of some stray f**ks or extra violent content, but I know that it was spiced up by all this hot foreclosure action. God, I'm getting erect just looking at this real estate sign. Jeremy says boner. Is this a thing? Not Superman specifically, but hanging commemorative banners on this bridge in England? Is that a thing? If the movie invented it, that's a sin. If it's a normal thing, but the movie perverted it for fictional Superman, that's a sin. So pretty much everything's a sin, which of course means this mindset is also a sin. See, I could play that game too. Come and witness the excitement of an entire heist seen via briefcase cam. I find this particular sin peculiar because the last time you sinned this movie, you were really concerned about Diana being shot from this perspective. Now that you realize all the people in this scene were shot in this way, are you going to retroactively remove a sin for being an overzealous mad-at-nothing SJW? No? Well, shit. Ruby sure does spend an inordinate amount of time on this failed heist, especially early on. I guess it's supposed to show how brazen criminals are now that Superman is gone and how badass Wonder Woman is, but we already know that sh the dick does this have to do with any of the rest of the main narrative? This scene, and others like it, is showing what Diana is up to currently. It has nothing to do with criminals or brazen now that Superman is gone, because this is in the UK. Superman is generally doing the hero thing in America. He's not going to be stopping petty crimes in another country. Who are you? 
The lasso of Hastia compels you to reveal the truth. Do you need to explain the truth rope to the person you're using the truth rope on, or do you just want need the truth? I have a sneaking suspicion that line was thrown in just for you, CinemaSins, because otherwise you'd be all, Why doesn't he tell her the truth? Why doesn't he lie? Why doesn't he look under her skirt? Because that's something I would do, especially if she were tin. <laughs> the scene of Wonder Woman kicking all the ass in the room kicks, well, all the ass. And I want to remove a sin. I really do. But we get so f***ing little of this moving forward in this movie, which definitely has room for it. And I'm just pissed enough to add five instead. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche. Yes! Yes! That was badass! Wonder Woman commits murder in front of a bunch of school children! Cool, cool, cool. The fact that you consider this a sin is hilarious. These kids were literally being shot at by these terrorists. He's lucky this wasn't in Inglewood because those kids bust back. Oh yeah, baby! This dude took a magic carpet ride, arriving on an ear splitting loud and boomer just to meet these straight shooting women to tell them that he's born to be wild. Well, I've only got one thing to say about that. Stay off the weed! Stay off the weed! Stay off the weed! I have come to enlighten you to the great darkness! Honestly, a little more darkness here would have helped you look more realistic. As it is, you look like a 3D poster I might find at Spencer Gifts after all the reasonable shoppers have made their purchases. Oh, be nice. The CGI in this version is way better than this. As I watch this battle between parademons and Wonder Women, I'm left with the thought that sometimes movies are trimmed down for a reason. You're not entirely wrong for this sentiment. However, you're sending a movie that exists to literally show everything that was shot and filmed because the fans asked for it. This is not a legitimate sin. And I want to ask why we do this with comic book movies. Do we honestly believe that every single shot in The Godfather Part Two was absolutely necessary to tell the story it did? The answer is no, but you're not going to say that about a movie like that anyway. My question is, why? As the flying thing takes the glowing box from the horse riding archer lady, I'm left to wonder, what movie am I even watching again? Well, let's see. An insectoid alien is fighting earthly warrior women to retrieve alien technology that could spell doom for the entire world. Sounds exactly like a comic book to me. Cut it! Go! God damn, one of the Transformers gonna show up and fucking help these people. That's not a sin for the movie. That's you making an obscure jo I, I mean, Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. I guess Steppenwolf can summon his own Bifrost anytime he needs to, but he uses it so rarely that I'm convinced every time he does it, it lowers his sperm count or something. Yes, yes, I get the silly joke, but the issue you're attempting to point out here is that Steppenwolf isn't using a useful ability. The problem is that boom tubes are created by the mother boxes. It's not something Steppenwolf can just turn on and off without utilizing them. Follow the sins of the mother boxes. Find the missing tube. Fuck you, Wolfie, do it yourself! This is exactly as useless as Thanos sending out Ebony Maw, Proxima Midnight, and oh, who's the other guy? Jack Black? I don't know. Anyway, f*** this outsourcing of the most important task in the world to this villain. Are you pretending you haven't seen a movie you're sending again? Steppenwolf does do it himself. He shows up at every mother box and takes them personally. He's asking his minions to find them, not retrieve them. Not to mention Darkseid didn't outsource this task to him. Steppenwolf is doing this to get back in Darkseid's good graces. It's still weird to me that this dude is named Steppenwolf instead of Prism Guy or Reflector Man. Morphin Mighty Mo. <laughs> Using a pocket memo cassette voice recorder in the 21st f***ing century. Says the guy that still uses a Zoom H2N handy recorder for his YouTube videos. How is it you're the one with all the money and subscribers, but I'm the one with the Neumann? Step your game up, Jeremy Scott. I don't care if it's a weekday, holiday, Bastille Day, Thanksgiving Day, Training Day, Boxing Day, or Doris Day. Ain't no f***ing way there's not a giant line queued up outside the Louvre. Let me introduce you to my homie 2020 and his girlfriend, COVID. Okay, I know what some smartass in the comments section wants to say. But Birdman, this movie didn't experience 2020, blah, blah, blah. I'll remind you that Jeremy said no f***ing way. Here's a way. I know the Louvre is full of ancient art, but this tube TV set seems like it's the most outdated item in this entire museum. Yeah, but it works and it fits in the corner where they need it to fit. Imagine trying to put a 16-9 monitor in that space. That shit would be smaller than your penis. <laughs> yes! I know, Jeremy, I'm pretty funny. But still, 
this f***ing laugh. Also, this is very much Wonder Woman the Mummy, and that'd be okay with me if Brendan Fraser were anywhere around here. So, it's a sin that a character who, in at least three movies now, has been characterized as a curator and procurer of ancient art, does a little bit of tomb reading? Are you sending characterization again, Willis? I don't know exactly where this is, but I have to say their sweater game is strong, man. Like Ransom from Knives Out is even getting a boner looking at all this cable knit. Wait, am I taking a sit off, adding one, or just making an observation? F it, I got distracted. Since it was that easy to take me out of the movie, here's a sin. I think it says more about you than the movie if you're getting distracted by turtleneck sweaters, hombre. Yeah, they're nice and all, but sweaters took you out of a comic book movie? Seriously? <laughs> Also, Jeremy says boner. Why does Arthur even drink? He's a goddamn god, right? There's no way he can get drunk, especially off a measly quarter bottle of whiskey. I know he's got a human side from his dad, but it seems like the god part is much stronger, especially considering how his standalone movie turned out. Jeremy does the thing that people always do to mix children, force them to choose one side or the other. Listen, when you are mixed, you are both those things. Stop listening to idiots that say you're not black if you have a white parent. I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but it's archaic nonsense that needs to die. Arthur is still a human, and considering he drinks, he very obviously can get drunk. Or hell, he might just like the taste. I realize he's trying to set up the whole thing here with future bigger, badder, big bads, but this scene just makes Steppenwolf seem weak and sniveling, undercutting his supposed menacingness later on. It absolutely does not. I mean, he bodied the Amazonians and lived to tell the tale. He is already certified in these streets. All this does is show that Darkseid is clearly a cut above this character. If the characters of this film struggle with Steppenwolf, then the movie has done its job of letting the audience know just how powerful Darkseid really is. Prototype troop carrier. I once knew a man who would have loved to fly it. Goddamn Diana! I know Steve Trevor had some dreamy eyes, but that was over a century ago. Move the f on! As I'm going to explain to you in a more tiresome, irksome, and depressing ass video that I stopped writing to write this one, Diana is a goddess. The thing about immortal beings is that they don't experience time in the way that we do. For her, a century is like yesterday. Amazons, before their betrayal and enslavement, and guardians from the stars. Wait, did she just yada yada both the enslavement of the Amazonians and the emergence of the f***ing Green Lantern? That sh seems pretty important, no? No, she didn't. The Green Lantern Corps only has significance to us, the audience, because we know the comics. Which is the reason I'm side-eyeing you right now, because you don't know shit about the comics. They're not impressive to Diana, is what I'm saying. And we got the spiel about the Amazonians' enslavement in the Wonder Woman movie. What, were you asleep? You know what? <laughs> Never mind. Is Darkseid waged war on Earth? Are we really still narrating over an hour into this thing? Tell me, what's wrong with narration, narrator of Cinema Sins? Mother boxes? Is Bruce seriously continuing to turn a fucking wrench while Diana is literally telling him about the end of the world? Well, yeah, I'm Batman. Oh shit, dude, you're back? Oh yeah, guess who's back? Back again. Batman's back. Here's a sin. To conquer, three boxes have to synchronize and join together into the unity. What the fucking balls are you talking about? The unity? Weren't you listening? Zeus and his son Ares. Every time Wonder Woman makes like old timey mythology gods are real, it makes me laugh. But then it makes me angry that they aren't doing more to kick all the ass. Jeremy continues to balk at the idea that mythological figures are a part of a comic book movie's reality. A comic book movie's reality. Not only that, he asks for Zeus to kick ass while showing a scene of him bodying some parademons, which is a part of a larger scene showing Zeus helping defeat Darkseid. Wait, there's an experienced Lantern Corps person here? And he doesn't end the battle by snapping his fingers? The f***? Why would there be only one Lantern Corps person here anyway if this was such an important battle? And why did the one guy shoot a flimsy green laser out of his chest and then get beaten down like a chump instead of, oh, I don't know, unleashing the actual full power of the Green Lanterns against this bitch villain and ending it all right here and now? Green Lantern peeps are f***ing mega powerful, you dopes. Whoa, does Jeremy think power rings are infinity stones or something? I'm not sure why he would assume a Green Lantern is more powerful than Zeus. Lanterns are powerful, but they're not winning a war by themselves. That's why it's the Green Lantern Corps. As for why there's only one here, this lantern was assigned to protect Earth. The Corps have many other things they need to worry about than a routine invasion by Apocalypse, which was the assumption because no one knew the anti-life equation was on Earth at that time. Earth is but one of 10,000 planets Usus was attempting to conquer. Guys, I know Darkseid is pretty f***ing strong, but isn't Zeus, like, the gaudiest god to ever god? Sure, he's tied to Earth and sh**, but 
Zeus? Shouldn't he be able to handle this shit by himself if he's this engaged? Can we get a ruling on the power differential of these two in the movie so I can have some f***ing context? The context is literally in the movie, though. They're showing that Zeus can't defeat Darkseid by himself. Zeus is powerful, but Darkseid requires multiple godlike characters to defeat him, and even then, Darkseid will usually come out on top. He's not heart of the universe Thanos, but this dude eats. And that'll teach you to never blindly follow your evil leader into battle with our planet. Even though you were previously a regular inhabitant of a planet and Darkseid turned you into this being. Ha <laughs> ha! Suck my trident, you chewed! Jeremy yells at the screen cliche. Men, Atlanteans, and Amazons. Each would enshrine and guard one of the three sleeping mother boxes. Sorry, give me one. I just need to laugh a bit. Hang on. I won't be long, I swear. <laughs> this f***ing laugh. <laughs> Granted, I laugh too, but at this laugh, not whatever Jeremy is laughing at, because I can't tell you what he's laughing at. So these sins are not only for the laugh, but also because it's apparently random. Sure, this happens to everyone at some point. You lose something in the space between the seats when you're driving and you want to grab that shit before you forget it. But this asshole is driving this giant rig right through the heart of Central City. And while he's grabbing for his fucking burger, he decides to speed up the truck rather than pull over to the curb, which is completely clear. This is a bigger villain than Darkseid, Steppenwolf, and Joker together. I think Baramese was funnier. Resident Evil 2 Remake. Okay, this is a pretty rad scene, even if we've already been through Quicksilver's time in a bottle and sweet dream sequences in that other franchise. But my major issue is why Flash has to break the fucking glass. If he's this fast, can't he just open the door like a normal metahuman? He has time to be pervy about the flying lady and grab a hot dog later during the rescue. This poor pet store owner is gonna have to fill out so many insurance forms. He got you on this one too. Also predicted the Quicksilver quip as well. Christ, does every superhero movie need to have a Quicksilver scene? First it was Over the Hedge, then it was Sonic, and now Super Friends? Is there anything original in the MCU? Gah! Oh, Cyborg used to play football, you say? In the snow? At night with a multi-million dollar video scoreboard? Okay. I mean, it's your movie, so I'll take what you have to offer, I guess. <laughs> Man, you just say random things in these videos sometimes. What the hell was that? This is Gotham City University. Why wouldn't they have a multi-million dollar scoreboard? This school is D1. Thank God we got to see Cyborg score the game-winning touchdown in his collegiate career. Honestly, I would have been lost over this character arc if we hadn't seen him single-handedly lead the Dillon Panthers to victory and getting John Voight fired in the process. It's at this point where you realize that CinemaSins is arbitrarily padding the runtime of this video. CinemaSins fanboys that come here to leave dislikes, can you honestly say that this was something this video needed? Ponder that while I go to the Quickie Mart and grab some tampons for you guys. Be right back. If you were there, Mom would still be alive. Jesus, Vic, what kind of a conclusion is this to jump to? If Dad had been there, you probably would have left in the same car at the same time after the game, with the same weather conditions that led to the same car slamming into your asses. I know Mom wasn't necessarily watching the road before the wreck, but you got T-boned. How the hell would Silas being there have changed anything? Mm, debatable. It's entirely possible adding another element to this mix could have caused them to go down a different road, like, say, the father wanted a pizza on the way home, so they took a different route. Based on what actually happened, the mother was driving distracted due to her son's sadness. That sadness was caused by his father's absence. <laughs> Jeremy sneezes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. In the world of ones and zeros, you are the absolute master. Couldn't Silas have just said this to Victor? I know Victor's pissed at him, but if he's willing to listen to the tape, he could have listened to the actual person, right? That is not how that works. Victor chose to listen to the tape on his time. He also chose not to entertain his father. How do you not see the difference? Also, are we gonna just gloss over the fact that Silas gave the power of everything to a brooding, moody, hormonal dude in his early 20s? I know Victor was wise beyond his years before the accident, but he's still a young man, and he can literally control nukes now. Do we know what happens if he accidentally gets a cyboner? No, we don't, but we do know what happens when you say that word. Bruce Wayne throwing a batarang at this kid to force the kid to show that he is in fact the Flash may look cool, but it's still attempted murder. Hell no. That not only looks cool, it is cool. Psh, attempted murder. Forcing us to listen to you laugh is attempted murder. You're the Batman? How does Barry know who Batman is, but doesn't recognize Bruce Wayne when he introduced himself earlier? Sure, Bats is famous, but he's not on the same level as one of the richest and most powerful playboys in the world, right? Not for nothing, if Elon Musk was just sitting at my desk when I came home, I would also be like, what the fuck, bro? Moreover, why would Bruce Wayne be more interesting than Batman? 
Hmm, a playboy or a real life superhero? I'd like to think that most men would be more impressed at the latter. God damn, this casual Bruce Wayne mobile is sexy as fuck, and I want to fuck it as much as I want to drive it. Ugh, oh, thrust. Ugh, oh, thrust. This car fucks. What kind of shit is that? I lost someone I loved once. I found him again in 1984, which I guess was before this, so I lost someone I loved twice is what I meant to say. Yes, yes, but isn't twice before? You're looking at the hottest thing on earth. That's what I said to my college. Exact words I said to my prom date. Hey, what the hell, man? That's kind of my thing. And that's why he's single and you make YouTube video. Oh, right. Who needs an actual CGI budget when you've got an underwater battle? Just scribble a few sketches down on your Microsoft Surface, cover the background with some neon fog, bada bing, bada boom, done. Here's another instance where I think Baramy did a superior job. Amber Heard. Deus Aquamanica. And this one too. Aquasimp. I knew her. Well, that makes one of us. Is this really the time to have this conversation after battling the biggest bad to ever bad here and losing a precious infinity stone just seconds ago? <laughs> I'm just saying, to all the people that got mad at me for all the Marvel jokes in the parody, eat shit. Years here, and then he goes to Metropolis and kidnaps eight people. Is it just me, or does this guy's face look like he's a giant roach wearing a skin costume? Any moment now, he's gonna go, Is that better?